Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is writer Jeff Strand. Jeff's latest book is The Writing Life, Reflections, Recollections, and a Lot of Cursing. Jeff has published multiple short story collections and many novels, including Autumn Bleeds into Winter, Wolf Hunt, Clowns vs. Spiders, and many more. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Great. So what's your favorite Christopher Moore novel? <laughs> So do I need to give the history behind that question? Uh, well, I was actually going to follow it up. <laughs> so you can go ahead and give the history behind that question. The history behind that question is that the very first time I did an audio interview, I was really excited. I was all ready to go. And the first question was, so you write horror comedy. What do you think of Christopher Moore? I was like, oh, I love Christopher Moore. I've read all his books. He's one of my favorites. From then on, every question for the rest of the interview was about Christopher Moore. It was the Christopher Moore and nothing else interview. And then when I was done answering questions about Christopher Moore, she was like, all right. And my guest today has been Jeff Strand. Thank you very much. It's like, uh, okay. <laughs> so, I'm happy to talk about Christopher Moore, but I didn't realize that was going to be the entire subject of my very first audio interview. So, Yeah, well, ho hopefully this will be a little bit better. <laughs> So if someone hasn't heard about your new book yet, how would you describe the writing life? It is basically the writing life. It is my, it's a very anecdote heavy, heavily comedic book with basically just my thoughts about the writing life. It is definitely not a how-to guide, but it is, it covers instead of, you know, here's how you get an agent or here's how you properly formulate form here's how you properly format your manuscript it is um you know here is what you do when you've got a book signing and nobody shows up or here's how to cope with rejection so it's kind of like here are the parts that suck about writing and here's how you get through them that so it's i tried not to make it you know a nihilistic writing is horrible there's a lot of great stuff but a lot of it is how to overcome the parts that aren't as much fun as you thought they were going to be so have you read other writing memoirs like Stephen King's or others? Oh, yeah. I've read a bunch of them. So, yeah. And, you know, Stephen King's is great. Stephen King's is one of the best ones out there. But Stephen King was successful, like, from when he was 26 and has been successful for the past 50 years. So mine is kind of aimed more at the people whose attitude is, you know, I thought I'd be a little bit more successful by now. You know, it's not aimed at multimillionaire New York Times bestsellers. It's aimed at people who are closer to my level. And so what was your writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? Well, I started a long time ago. So when I started, traditional publishing was really the only way you went. You didn't, you know, now you can self-publish and I love self-publishing and it is perfectly okay. But in the olden days of yore, when I began, you didn't do that. You, The process was you got an agent who then sold your book to a traditional publisher. But it was, A, my stuff wasn't good enough when I first started writing, and B, it was kind of quirky and weird. So it, you know, I was doing what everyone else does. You write a book, you send it to agents, they don't take you on, it doesn't sell, and then you write another book, and you have what used to be called trunk novels which were books that you gave up on because you had hopefully started writing other stuff instead of just waiting to find out what happened with the book you just finished. So I just, you know, gathered a very large trunk full of stuff as I learned to write, you know, just thousands of pages of practice writing. And then what happened to me was in the year 1999, Someone said, you know, have you ever heard of electronic publishing? Like, I, I'm familiar with it. I would never, ever, under any circumstances, self-publish. Like, no, it's not self-publishing. It's traditional publishing, just a different format. So I looked up some publishers and thought, you know what? I'm not having any luck with the quote-unquote real publishers. Maybe I'll try this out. Now, at the time, electronic publishing was like worse than not being published because people didn't understand it. They assumed that if it was an ebook. It was, you know, unpublishable. And in many cases, they were right. But I decided to give that a try. So my credibility took a huge hit <laughs> because, you know, in the year 2000, 
No one, there, there were no Kindles. People didn't know what eBooks were. They were scared of them because they thought they were going to take over the industry. Now everyone has a Kindle. You can read books on your phone. You know, people, if I say my book's available on Kindle, they understand what you mean. Back then they didn't. So it was, it was rough going for a few years. And then I got some small press deals. So I had my books in print. So they were kind of like real books. And then I got, you know, the elusive mass market contract where you could go into a bookstore, look under the fiction shelf and Hey, there it was. It was a fiction book by everyone's definition. It was, you know, I had made it by any definition of having made it as a writer, but that was when self-publishing started to become legitimized and self-publishing for me pays way better because it's 70% royalties versus 6% royalties. So basically around the time that I had finally broken in, I was part of the inner circle. That's when self-publishing became a thing. And I kind of gravitated much more towards that. So I sort of circled around from, I will never self-publish to self-publishing is the best thing ever. <laughs> and, and so do you remember kind of the initial spark, uh, you know, many years ago that, that got you into writing? I mean, what, what, <laughs> kind of kept you going through all that time? Well, weirdly, there was never a time when I didn't want to be a writer. It goes back so far that I can't even tell where it came from, except for the fact that, you know, I always liked to read. And, you know, when I couldn't read, my mom would read to me a lot. So books were always a big part of my life, but I've always wanted to be a writer. What kept me going really was just the, you know, insane belief that I would succeed. And I always kind of thought it would be the next year. So it was, well, I'm still in my day job, but next year will be the last year of that. And then next year will be the last year of that. And then next year will be the last year of that. And what was happening, I was making tiny little steps. So what I wasn't moving backwards and I wasn't static. It's like, okay, my career is slightly better than it was before. And over many years, you would look back and say, okay, I've been doing this for 10 years, still have a day job, but I'm way better off than I was 10 years ago. And then finally, you know, about 15 years after my first book came out, it's like, okay, I'm doing well enough to quit my day job. Now I'm full time. So it was a slow build. There was no big breakthrough moment. It was just a long series of small baby steps that eventually added up to getting to quit my day job. And how has that self-publishing journey been for you? You know, it, I was definitely reluctant at first because, you know, I came from the time when self-publishing was poison. You just, you didn't do it. And then I tried it because um, my book Wolf Hunt was supposed to be published as a uh, mass market paperback through Leisure Books. And, you know, I had promoted it. We had the cover flats. It was fully edited. I hadn't quite started setting up book signings, but I had said, you know, December 2010, it's wolf hunt time. So, you know, my whole fan base knew that I had a book called Wolf Hunt that was going to be a real book. And then Leisure canceled their horror line. And so it was, okay, do I want to spend a couple of years trying to sell a werewolf novel and possibly not succeeding? Or do I want to ride the momentum of a book that I've already been promoting and just see what happens if I self-publish it? And my wife had started doing some artwork and she thought, well, do you a cover? Now that's what she does full time. She's, you know, a very successful cover artist. But at the time, Wolf Hunt was her first one. Like, let's try it. And so I did. And what I realized is that even though the sales were a lot lower than they would have been if it had been a leisure paperback, the royalties were so much higher that I made way more than I ever would have through leisure. So I was like, oh, I kind of like this. And so I sort of, well, I'm going to be a um, hybrid author. I will keep pursuing the traditional publishing, but at the same time, I'm going to do some self-publishing. And so all of my young adult books were um, traditionally published. So those were all, you go into Barnes & Noble and there they are on the shelf. And that was the primary method of distribution. But recently, over 
pretty much since going full time, I have been all in on self publishing, which is not to say I'll never traditionally publish again. I still want the traditional publishing contracts, but self publishing is what keeps me not crawling back to a day job. So I'm a big fan of it. Sure. And how many novels do you estimate that you that you publish in a year to kind of keep the self publishing ball kind of rolling in terms of, as you said, um, employment? Uh, it varies a lot. Last year was um, a lot. I think last year I had six books out, but this year I haven't actually had a book out yet in 2021. I've written a couple that aren't out yet for various reasons. I'm going to slow down the pace a little bit just because I don't have, I basically at the end of 2021, I had a book a month for the last three months of the year. And I've been able to ride that out. So I'm not desperately trying to get a new book out. And you know, my preference is not to overwhelm the readers. So it's like, okay, I'm, I had a little bit of movie option money and I can sort of not necessarily rush to get the next book out. So I don't have a specific goal. It's kind of, I have a specific amount that I like to make to keep me from crawling back to the day job. And as long mm -hmm. as I'm over that threshold, I can kind of hold off. And one of the great things about self-publishing is that I have the flexibility to do that. So I can have a book ready to go and just say, it'll be out soon. I don't have to, you know, with traditional publishing, you've got, you lock in the publication date, you know, six months or a year ahead of time. And I don't have to do that. I can kind of just say, surprise, new book available and go from there. So I'm taking advantage of the freedom and kind of watching the financial part more than the, I, my goal is to have five books out this year or six books out or three books out or whatever. It's kind of when I need a new book out, I can put it out, but I'm sure. kind of able to take advantage of the flexibility that self-publishing offers. Well, in addition to novels and short stories, you've also written screenplays. Are you still writing screenplays? Yeah. What happened was I start. that's how I started in college and high school. I was, you know, I wanted to be a screenwriter and I didn't sell anything. I wrote, you know, over a dozen scripts and then every once in a while it would come back. But for the most part, I wasn't really focused on it because I was focused on fiction. And then really just recently, you know, I had a bunch of book optioned, but other people were writing the scripts. I wasn't involved at all in the process. But then I optioned my books, uh, The Greatest Zombie Movie Ever, which is a young adult comedy, and Cutter, which is a really dark serial killer book. And that production company said, hey, we'd like you to write the script. I'm like, sure. So I sort of got back into it. And then a filmmaker in Austin said, would you be interested in writing a original script for me? Like, I certainly will. And now I'm waiting on another adaptation. So I've kind of gotten back into it in a big way. So I don't know how much of my time it's going to take up, but right now I'm sort of balancing the screenwriting and the fiction. Fiction always has to take priority because that's where I know, you know, I know that if I put out a horror novel, it will make X amount of money and keep me, able to do this full-time screenwriting is still kind of a unknown component, but sure. yeah, I, after a long, long era where I wasn't really worried about that, I'm back into it. So cool. Well, like. given that you write a lot, when you're finishing up a novel, are you already thinking about the next book that you're going to write or do you wait until you finish the book and then literally sit down in front of a blank page or computer screen? No, usually I'm more excited about the book that I'm going to write than the book I'm trying to finish up. <laughs> There's always what happens to me is, and I don't think this is uncommon at all, but it's like when I first start a book, I am just all in. Like, yes, I'm writing a new book. This is the greatest feeling ever. And then about halfway through, I wish I was writing something else and anything else. So if I'm writing a horror novel, I wish I was writing a goofy comedy. If I'm halfway through writing a goofy comedy, I wish I was writing a horror novel. It's like halfway through, it's I can't quit, but boy, I wish I was writing anything else. And then, you know, you hear about authors who have the postpartum depression, depression where it's like 
they finish a book. It's like, oh, now I'm sad. What do I do with my life now? When I finish a book, I am in a celebratory mood. I am <laughs> so, so happy. It's like I get my life back again, freedom. So when I finish a book, I am all set. And I generally, by the time I'm done with the book, I know what the next book is going to be. So, yeah, I don't – I actually – at one point, I knew a few books ahead of time, but I always changed my mind. But a lot of the time, I only know one book ahead. I don't plan ahead that well. So I've got a few ideas, but it tends to be I don't know for certain what's coming next until I'm you know, in the final stretch of whatever I'm working on. Sure. And so what is the next book that you're going to publish? The next book I'm going to publish is my entry into the Possess Ventriloquist, du- Ventriloquist Dummy um, genre is called creep out. And that is my attempt to be super scary because I identify as a horror author, but I don't generally go for scary. I think my book creep out is, I think my book um, sick house is creepy for most of it, but uh, creep out is my attempt to be genuinely scary. I will let the readers decide if I actually succeeded or not, but this is, you know, hopefully a eerie, creepy, scary book. It's also a fun and like everything I write, it has a lot of humor, but it is my possessed ventriloquist dummy book. (laughs) So what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? Uh, Write a lot. Don't be afraid of the practice book in, you know, when I started, you didn't have a choice if you had gatekeepers. So if, the gatekeepers didn't think you were ready to be published. You didn't get published, which forced me to practice. Now that's gone. Now you, there are no gatekeepers. You can write your first novel and have it up on Amazon within 12 hours. So my, my advice is don't be afraid of the practice novel. If it is totally fine to finish a book and say, you know, I don't, I don't know that this is quite good enough. That is legitimate. That is the way it should be. You know, you're not really supposed to finish your first book and have it be a masterpiece. You're supposed to finish your first book and it sucks. And then you write another book that sucks less. And then you write another book and then you start to think, okay, this is starting to get good. So, you know, it's like a sport or a musical instrument. You're not supposed to be great at it right away. So you wouldn't pick up a violin and become a master violinist and you don't start to play football and become an NFL superstar, you practice. And it's the same thing with writing. The only difference is that you can publish a book, your first effort, whereas you're not going to get in the NFL and you're not going to start doing concerts if you haven't practiced a musical instrument. So practice as much as you want. It is totally okay if your work sucks at first. It's supposed to suck. Well, given that you self-publish, do you use an editor? I use beta readers. I'm actually really good at self-editing, which does not mean that mistakes don't get through. Mistakes always get through. But I'm lucky that I have over, you know, because I, when I had editors, I would still use beta readers because I, you know, I would go through it several times, make sure it's as clean as it possibly could be. Then I would send it to my beta readers. They would go through. And then by the time I get it to the editor, hopefully the editor has to do as little work as possible. But I'm good at self-editing. So by the time I send it to the beta readers, they're usually like, hey, that was really clean. So there's not a lot of changes. So at this point, I'm very comfortable. And I have beta readers. I'm lucky enough that I've got people who've been with me for, you know, some of them have been with me for more than 10 years. And they kind of pounce right on it. So it's not like, it's up to the beta readers. Now I get to wait six months for their feedback. It's basically... All right, sir, we are on the job. And so I'll get the (laughs) feedback really quickly, which gives me the luxury of having a really compressed time frame from when when I believe the book is fully edited to when I get the feedback. And I have, you know, it very, the amount of feedback varies, but I have like six to eight people. So by the time the book goes live, a lot of eyeballs have been on it. So. That's and great. also one nice thing about self-publishing is that if something does somehow manage to get through, generally not a typo, but you know, a factual error that someone caught that other people weren't familiar with, by the time I get that, excuse me, Mr. Strand, I just read your latest book and you should know that this was a mistake. I can fix that really quickly. So, 
It's not right. like a traditionally published mass market book where you're basically screwed, where you just have to live with it forever. You can yeah. stuff. So are there ever days that you sit down to write and the words just aren't coming? And if so, what do you do on days like that? There are definitely days where I would rather, you know, watch movies on Netflix or do something else. Um, the two, the way I get through it is a lot of it is just, you know, go for a walk, listen to music until I'm, you know, motivated again. One thing I can do sometimes if I'm not on a tight deadline is to alternate, to have more than one thing going at once. So, okay, I'm stuck on the novel. I don't really feel like working on the novel today, but hey, I owe a short story. So I'll work on the short story instead. Or, you know, maybe today's a good day to start doing some of this website work. There's always something else I can be working on. So I don't have to say, you know, I don't feel like working on the book today. So I guess I'm just going to watch TV or I'm just going to go back <laughs> to bed. I always have something else I can work on. So I, not everyone should be working on multiple projects. Working on multiple projects can be disastrous if you can't focus. If you find yourself with a dozen half-finished books and no finished books, that's not good. But if you're able to focus, you know, working on a couple projects at once keeps me productive because I can always, you know, if I'm stuck on one, I can move to the other. Um, and, you know, not everyone, you know, this is for f um, full-time writers, but for me, you know, the financial aspect is a strong motivator because writing is the only way I make generate income. And if I don't generate income at some point, I'm going back to a day job and then I'll be very, very sad. So, <laughs> you know, the, the financial part is also a strong motivator, but sure. if you're not a full-time writer and you do get stuck a lot. I've always felt like working on multiple projects, even if it's novels and a short story, any kind of creative project you have on the side that you can switch over to if you're stuck on one is a good way to keep yourself writing, even if on a particular day you don't feel like a specific project. Sure. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? I've discovered I really like Nick Cutter, even though it is it is some of the most depressing horror ever. But his books, The Troop and The Deep, which I I'm a late comer to those are just, you know, as far as all out unapologetic horror, that's about as good as it gets. You know, I always like, you know, Stephen King is one of the most popular for a reason. I was late to his book. Um, now I'm completely um, revival. That is yes. you know, fantastic. That's a really great, great book. Um, so those are a couple of the ones I've read recently. I really enjoyed uh, David Wong's latest, Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick, which is science fiction comedy. But he started out doing horror. He did the John Dies at the End series. And then I followed him over to science fiction because he's one of my favorite authors. So that's those great. Are all that I have read recently that I enjoy a lot. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels and short story collections? Uh, jeffstrand.com that I'm that's my website it's got links to all the things if you're a twitter person at jeffstrand and you can see all of my delightfully amusing tweets and I think I said my wife did my cover without mentioning her so I better say Lynn Hansen so you can also go to lynnhansenart.com and see all about my cover artist Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Jeff Strand, author of the new book, The Writing Life, Reflections, Recollections, and a Lot of Cursing. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Jeff, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you very much. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Jeff Strand's novel, Cemetery Closing, available wherever audiobooks are sold. I think about death a lot because people are always trying to kill me. For example, right now, I was being held at gunpoint in some guy's living room. If you're new to my exploits, your reaction is probably, Oh my God, that's not good at all. How did he end up in this predicament? What's the backstory? The rest of you are thinking, Yeah, that sounds about right. The man with the gun wanted to shoot me, because he thought I was sleeping with his wife. I definitely wasn't. 
Even if we remove other key elements from the situation, moral issues, lack of opportunity, my fear of my own wife's wrath, etc., it's important to realize that I had absolutely no energy for any kind of extracurricular activities. None. The tank was empty. I was exhausted. If Helen told me I was allowed one night with Scarlett Johansson and a scantily clad Scarlett was crouched on the bed beckoning to me and saying, Come on, Stud, let's do this. I would proclaim that my greatest wish had been granted, politely ask Ms. Johansson to leave, and bask in a night of uninterrupted sleep. Here, let me catch you up. I'm Andrew Mayhem, 35 years old but feel about 72. In addition to my aforementioned wife, I have an 11-year-old daughter named Teresa and a 9-year-old son named Kyle. A lot of very bad stuff has happened to us. I mean, I once had to pose as a serial killer so I could infiltrate a group of psychopaths who were playing homicidal games in a billionaire's mansion. I'm not trying to be a whiner, but that was a terrible frickin' weekend. I've lost both of my pinky fingers, not at the same time. In my last madcap escapade, my parents were murdered. That wasn't even the worst part of the bad guy's master plan. What he wanted to happen is so messed up that I'm not even going to describe it here because it's the kind of thing you need to be eased into hearing about. If I dropped it right here into the recap, you'd say, nope, 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 I think I'll find other reading material, thank you very much. That was about a year ago. Everybody was in pretty bad shape when it was over. Of course, we're always in bad shape when these adventures are over. You should have seen me after the first one. We spent a few weeks mourning and healing, and then it was time for our next great big zany experience. As I said, I have a son and a daughter. When Helen and I found out that she was pregnant again, we were apprehensive, because my kids haven't fared very well having me for a father. I assume their tell-all book will be called Our Dad Keeps Getting Attacked by Psycho Killers and We Keep Getting Dragged Into His Shit. Teresa will probably ask to have her name legally changed before she starts dating. When we found out Helen was having triplets, we were basically in a state of shock. I mean, even wealthy people who don't find themselves frequently facing off against homicidal maniacs tend to go, uh, what? When they hear that they're having multiple new children instead of one. With twins, you break into a cold sweat and say, oh, um, okay, I guess we're doubly blessed. With triplets, you stare at the wall for a long time, not really seeing it silently haunted by your own thoughts. We'd gone through some seriously trauma-inducing stuff while Helen was pregnant, so there was reason to believe that there could be problems later. But she went into labor right on schedule, and my bumbling misadventures while getting her to the hospital were minimal. She gave birth to three healthy, beautiful baby daughters. I wanted to give them rhyming names or at least alliteration, but was overruled by my entire family. Instead, we returned home with Brianna, Cecilia, and Rose. And I never slept again. So when the angry husband kidnapped me while I was out buying diapers and accused me of sleeping with his wife, I would have laughed in his face if he didn't have a gun. Infidelity? Now? Couldn't he see the dark circles under my eyes? The way I could barely hold up my head? How I kept gazing longingly at the pillow on the end of his couch? I should kill you right now, said the husband, pacing around his living room while he kept the gun pointed at me. Please don't, I said. You think it's okay to sleep with another man's wife? Is that the kind of person you are? Doesn't anybody have a moral code anymore? I didn't sleep with your wife. The hell you didn't. I haven't had sex with anybody in almost a year, and I'm counting myself. I know I've done something vaguely along those lines in the past because I have five kids, but I really don't think of people in those terms anymore. Liar! Who's your wife? He walked over to a shelf and picked up a framed picture of a happy couple on their wedding day. I recognized the groom because he was currently pointing a gun at me, but I'd never seen the bride. 